Hey everyone, this video is an overview of my Remu project from spring to summer 2020 using Blender 2.9. I spent a few months trying out different workflow methods and even making some new tools of my own. I've had many questions and tutorial requests. Before we get into step-by-step -step videos, let's start with a bird's eye view summary of what goes into a character like this. We'll be taking a look at the character's body, clothing, eyes, hair, rigging, shaders, and more. If you like my content and want to help me make more tutorials faster, please consider following me on Twitter or supporting my new Patreon. I'll be doing regular video and educational file releases with lots of tips and helpful content, but a lot of my time goes to my day job. Even a little bit of support will go a long way towards letting me work on this content instead. The character's body is actually one of the weakest parts of the project, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. I don't have much of a background in anatomy, and even if I did, anatomy is always hard. This is what the topology looked like for the Raymu project, but I've upgraded it a bit since. Notably, I've worked a lot on the face to have a higher density of topology in the face than the rest of the body, which has resulted in some triangles, but it's worth it. We'll talk more about why the face is like this when we get to the shading and normal editing section. This body actually began its life as the realistic anime female base mesh in the MB Lab add on. MB Lab is a character creator add on that works kind of like a video game character creator where you have various sliders you can use to adjust things. It starts out looking pretty freaky because the base character is just 0.5 on every possible parameter. But with some work with the sliders and then some sculpting, you can get pretty nice results. This is the old body I used for my Rain before that Miku projects. As you can see, it's the same body, but with the face stylized more. It's a bit too high poly for a stylized character, so for Reimu, I decrease the complexity, in a, both in the face and everywhere except the arms, and then after Reimu, I actually got around to doing the arms. I've been gradually learning bodies and topology. My main focus when working on characters is clothing and hair and shading, as that's what I feel most interested in working on. So it's been a slow burn on learning anatomy and topology, but everyone has to get there eventually. The body is rigged with Blender's Rigify add-on, which I assume most people will be familiar with. And if you're not, check it out. It comes with Blender, and it's a great place to start with a basic rig. I have added my own wrinkles to it, however. First of all, I'm actually using a deform cage that the body is inside of using the mesh deform modifier. This is because at the time I was rigging, I was making lots of changes to the topology, and it was easier to just rebind the deform cage than to worry about redoing weight painting all the time. The second thing I've added is two layers of corrective bones to help the joint quality. These are based on Dan Pro's tutorials, which I'll link in the description. You can see I've got a bone to help control the knee camp and the back of the knee and the ankle and also the inner thigh, the rear, elbows, etc. What these bones are doing is, as the shin rotates, it's pulling the back of the knee back and down, although I think the effect might be turned up a bit too high. And this works with the transform bone constraint to drive the bone based on rotation of the shin. That can also be done with drivers, of course. I've also added knee and elbow offset bones, also based off Dan Pro's tutorials. You can see as I rotate this, a gap actually opens up between the shin bone and where it originally was. If I disable this copy rotation, you can see the difference it's making. This is an approximation of how real knees work, so that you get it rotating around, not just off a single axis. Again, I probably need to work on these values, but one of the nice things about working on Reimu is that she wears a lot of baggy clothing, so I put these various anatomy correctives in place, but I wasn't too worried about the details. 
I also made the major change of replacing Rigify's entire face rig with my own new bendy bone face rig. I did this for several reasons. First, I wanted to see what it was like to work with bendy bones, as they didn't really exist when Rigify was made, and it, it does use them a bit now, but its face rig is an older style. Second, they're easy to work with and weight paint because they only need one weight group per bone. If you had multiple bones in the same area, you'd have to have three, time, three or four times as many weight groups. So they're actually quite easy to set up comparatively, although no face rig is simple. The next, they're good for tune characters because they can do all sort of stretching and squishing and whatever. And lastly, I wanted a rig that could not only make expressions, but could also be used to effectively re-sculpt the character's whole face and make major changes to what it looks like. And they're great for that because they just give you so much control over the mesh. I wanted to be able to make new, entirely new characters just by messing with my rig a bit. If you're not familiar, bendy bones work a lot like Bezier curves. So this is kind of like having a curve rig for the face. A big focus of this project for me was learning to work with multi-layered cloth and mostly using cloth sim instead of bone rigging for it. Blender's cloth sim used to not be very good, but it got a lot better in 2.8, and now is actually very viable. But if we take a look at this cloth topology, it's actually pretty funky. There's all sorts of weird stuff going on here. And the reason for that is because this clothing was originally made in another program called Marvelous Designer. Marvelous Designer is a physics-based cloth sewing program where you draw out your pattern in 2D, just like real sewing, and then sew it together with physics in 3D. It's very powerful and gives you a lot of control over cloth thin, and its cloth simulation is more powerful than Blender's. You can handle layers really well, you can drape stuff, you can do all sorts of different parameters. It's a bit laggy here while I'm also running OBS to record the screen but the performance is quite good and you can interact with it in real time. So this is where the base of the outfit was originally made. So the reason this topology is so funky is because in Marvelous Designer, it was drawn in 2D as a vector pattern, and then the topology is automatically generated. And it's automatically generated to maintain consistent vertex distance, not to have clean loops like you would if you were modeling things regularly. And if we take a look at the necktie, this actually has clean loops, which is how you can tell that I made it in Blender instead of in Marvelous Designer. And same with the collar here. But notice that as you go further down, the vertices are further apart, so you have a different density. Cloth Sim primarily cares about density and not loops. This funky topology doesn't matter for Cloth Sim, but it can matter for Theta. There's all sorts of issues in shading with using triangles or pods at weird angles, and if we flip over into the pose, we can see that we get pretty nasty zigzag shading when crossing diagonally over these quads. And with the angles that these quads go at, that comes up more often than if we had a clean quad mesh, although nobody can avoid this entirely. Luckily, there is a pretty easy fix. Let's throw on some subsurf, and we can see that the zigzag gets smaller, and now let's throw on even more subsurf like we'd have on a final render. And after several seconds of it locking up to handle that, it's basically clean. So it is technically a problem, but it's a problem we can solve by just throwing more computing resources at it. Now, while I use Marvelous Designer to make this cloth, that is by no means necessary to make outfits like this. Even since I originally made this back in the spring, there's been lots of new tools developed to do similar pattern-based sewing workflows in Blender, and also tons of new cloth sculpt brushes that have been developed. So it's easier than ever to work with cloth in Blender itself. While most of the cloth was made in Marvelous Designer, a lot of the finer details were still done in Blender, and even the large shapes were refined. For example, most of the bow and these big ribbons was made in Marvelous Designer, but this squish here where it's tied was actually done in Blender, and the ruffles are all done in Blender. There's quite a few ruffles on the character, and they look complicated, but they're actually pretty easy to make. 
You start by making a single segment, duplicate it with an array modifier, distort it with a lattice using proportional edit with random falloff, then maybe hit it with a bit of sculpting after applying all of that. Then you just use a curve modifier to attach it to the edge of your cloth. You can copy one loop, duplicate it out, convert it to a curve, and place your ruffles that way. So they're actually pretty easy to do. The shoes, of course, are modeled in a regular fashion, nothing fancy there. And the chest wraps were laid down originally with um, snapping, snapping to face, and shrink wrap. And then I used Alt S to raise some of them to create layers. Since most of the cloth is simulated into position, most of it didn't need to be rigged, but there are a few areas that did. The ribbons are not simulated. They have their own B bones on these ones and regular bones here, which can be used to adjust the pose. The issue with using B bones is since they stretch things into position, if you go too far, it won't really look like cloth anymore, so there won't be proper wrinkles. Then in some places, it was necessary to take some shortcuts. The shirt fits pretty closely to the body in the upper area. So in this vertex group here, it actually uses the mesh to form instead of cloth sim. Only the lower part is simulated. And then the collar actually did a special attention. Because if we get in here, you can see it is thick in one area and thin in another. And that's no good for cloth sim. So actually, there's another version of it, which the cloth sim runs on. And then this version that has a split here and modifiers is surface deformed to the simmed version. There's lots of little tricks like that you can do when working in cloth and makes it quite a bit easier to mix low detail sim meshes and high detail uh, fine render meshes, but that's the only one I had to do for this project. The cloth itself was simmed into position over about 60 frames once a pose had been made, and it ends up looking like this. I'm not going to go in detail into the cloth settings because that could take 20 minutes on its own. Once the sim was done, I did clean some areas up by hand with sculpting, so that's part of the advantage of this workflow. Here are a couple clips of simulation tests earlier in the development, just so you can get an idea of what it looks like. If you've watched my previous videos, you know that getting clean mesh hair has been one of my major goals. If you haven't watched my previous video on flat modeling anime hair, I suggest you go check that out now, because that is how the bangs were made. It's a flat sheet that's wrapped onto the head with a lattice modifier and some other modifiers working on that, curve and simple to form. That's all covered in the previous video. So it's a very convenient technique to use. The gathered hair in the back here works the same way. So there's another lattice wrapping mint. Then we've got the ponytail, which is a collection of loose strands. I decided to try several different things here. So these are not joined together at the edge and they're a bit worse off for it. But since they're in the back, it's not really visible. If I put more work into this character, I'd probably merge some of these edges or do something else to improve it. The hair in the front here, though, does have some of the edges merged, or at least lined up. So it's a bit cleaner. This and the ponytail were both simply modeled flat and straight, and then a uh, curve modifier and Bezier curves was used to position it. The centerpiece of this project, and the area I spent the most time, is the long hair in the back. Reimu normally has pretty long hair, but I decided to try to make ultra big, super long hair, and it mostly worked. Let's take a look at the rig. This hair had to be modeled in a certain way so that a rig like this could work. It's a bendy bone rig, but it has some special features. For example, there are controllers to zip the edges together. <laughs> 
either on an individual basis or the whole side of the hair. And then there's other tweak bones and all of this stuff stretches and interpolates and just gives a ridiculous amount of control. We take a look at the main pose. See how that looks in the back. This long hair is modeled with the same principles as the hair in the front. It is flat modeled. Let's take a look at what happens when we turn off this crazy amount of modifiers that goes into it. And then there's also the, some shape keys. So this is what the hair actually looks like. It's a rectangle cut into pieces. The way this was made is actually pretty simple. I created a plane and I knifed a pattern into it. I actually projected a Voronoi texture to give me some guidelines. The reason for this is so that when the different strands are edge to edge, they can still merge together. You can even use the weld modifier to combine the edges. Then all the shape is added to the hair with shape keys, but mostly the modifier stack. Having a non-destructive setup like this is super convenient. It makes it very easy to make changes to the mesh or UVs or whatever. Let's take a look through the stack. First of all, we have a shape key that tapers the tips, but only a little bit. It's really only doing the final loop and a little bit on the loop before. Then we have several shape keys that spread out the tips. They're separated by different bundle segments. Now let's look at some of these modifiers. First of all, we have a modification to the base shape that stretches it out near the roots. And that's based on a lattice. Let's turn that on. That's based on this lattice, which is giving us that shape. The next, we have more smoothing on the tips. This is what actually tapers the hair properly. And since it's set up this way, we can control the amount. And we can control the amount worth a vertex group. If we take a look at the group, we can see that different strands are getting different amounts of smoothing. In fact, every strand has a random amount of smoothing on it. The next modifier adjusts the length. It's a displace modifier moving things in the Z direction. Since the hair is laid out flat, we can make a change based off a global axis like this. If it was curved, changing the length would actually be quite difficult. I'm not even sure it could be done. And again, this is running off a randomized vertex group. So you get different amounts in different areas. And we could adjust the modifier to change the strength of the effect until we find what we like. Moving on from that, we have a lattice that wraps it onto the back of the head as is normal. See that big one here? And this is using curve and simple to form just like is covered in the flat modeling hair tutorial. Now, actually, I need to turn that off again before turning on the various deforms because this is wrapping it separately and we'll get to that when we get to the rigging. Next is the smooths, which apply bundle by bundle. And nothing is actually happening when I turn them on. At least nothing is happening yet, but it will. Let's get to this one, randomized smooth. This is even more tapering on the tip, but also further up. And then we have some randomized displace to give a bit more thickness. And then last of all, we have subsurf. So this looks like a lot of modifiers, but since a lot of them are just the same modifier split down by bundle from left to right, then it's less than you'd think. So if you weren't breaking it down by bundle, this would be a much easier setup to make. Before we go further into what these modifiers are doing, let's take a second to look at the vertex group setup of this hair. First, it's divided into different bundles horizontally and different segments vertically. 
And then to create all the groups driving these different modifiers, I have some different gradients. And then it gets to these groups where the values are randomized for each mesh island. And that was created with a script because it will take way too much effort to do it all by hand. Blender does not have built-in tools to do things like generate or mix vertex groups. So I took my rudimentary Python knowledge and I made some. Here is animation nodes, which is a basically Python scripting nodes. And they're great because they have a lot of built-in functions, but they also allow you to just write your own scripts. This is the node layout for my vertex groups. So what I have here is this node generates a group with random weights per island. Then this node is multiplying it by an existing group. And then this final node writes it back to this first group that was created and updates it with the result of the math. And I have that same thing going on for several different of these groups. This is made possible by all of these nodes, and then also by a bunch of Python scripting, some of which is called in these nodes. Now, I didn't really know Python that well when I started writing this, so this is not a very efficient setup, which is why I haven't released it. It needs a lot of polish and a lot more work to make it nice. And that's true for some other tools that we'll get to in a bit as well. So I'm hoping to release these tools, but it'll take some more time. Now let's get back to those other modifiers. These first several are the actual hair rig. If we turn it on and show all the objects, you can see that when I'm moving these bones, it's actually affecting a lattice that the hair mesh is inside. And those lattices have been wrapped into this shape by the big wrap lattice that we looked at earlier. That's why we had to disable it on the original hair, because otherwise it would be moved into place twice. So these lattices are all inside the big wrap lattice and are then controlled by an armature. Well, two bone strands of bendy bones, one on each side. And the way this zipping rig works is if you have your lattices set on linear, then if they start out with the edges touching and then you move those edges into the same place again, it'll line up the vertices of the mesh inside exactly. So when this zipping bone is used, it pulls these edge bones together and realigns the edges of the mesh, well, the lattice and the mesh inside the lattice. And since the mesh is right up to the edge of the lattice and the lattice points overlap, you get a perfect alignment so good that you can even use the weld modifier to weld these edges together if you feel like it. Now you don't see lattices used like this in rigging very often. I'm basically using it as a deform cage, but without the need to bind anything. You can do this with mesh deform cages as well, but you have to do such a high level of binding precision to have the vertices still line up properly that your file ends up being gigabytes in size with all the binds and it takes forever. So the reason lattices aren't used that much is because the base form of a lattice has to be a rectangle. But we're solving that by using another lattice to wrap it into shape. And then lattices are very hard to bring to armatures. And if you want to understand why, let's go into weight paint mode. Oh wait, there is no weight painting mode for lattices. The only way to set weights on a lattice, let's hide this hair to make it a little bit easier to see this. In edit mode, we can control weights on a lattice but only through the edit mode interface. You have to select a point or points and then set the weight and then press the assign button on the relevant vertex group. So you essentially have to do every weight segment individually by hand and you don't have any gradient or blurring tools or anything. So it's technically there, but it's basically unusable because it just doesn't have weight paint mode implemented in the UI for whatever reason. So. Of course, I also solve that by writing a script, which looks like this. And what this does is it copies weights from a mesh to a lattice based on vertex proximity. 
So to use it, you have to make a, a mesh that has exactly the same number of vertices and exactly the same position. And then you do all your weight painting on that mesh, and then you run the script, and it will copy the vertex groups and the weight amounts to the lattice. And that's another tool that I hope to release at some point soon, or by the time I, mean, I wrote most of this back in the spring of 2020. So for all I know, someone's already done it. Now we can get back to the rest of these modifiers. So these def bundle are simply the lattices on the different bundles of hair. So the only thing left is these smooths, which don't appear to be doing anything. And that's because they don't do anything until the hair zipping is used. Now if we spread this hair out and then disable these, we can see that the hair is badly stretched. And that's because as the deform cage stretches, it stretches everything in it. And that will happen everywhere on the hair where stretching is taking place with the zipping effect. So what these smooths do is they smooth out the hair to taper it more and compensate for that additional stretch. And they are controlled by a driver. The factor is based on the distance between these two bones, and also on this controller, which can be used to taper them even more. So we can see 0.7, if we reset this and move it together, 0.03, it's practically off. This isn't a perfect way to deal with stretching, and it has some limitations, but it works pretty well. The driver expression itself is pretty complicated with a lot of moving parts. It has to factor in the distance between the two different bones, the extra controls, and some more things. That will have to wait for its own tutorial. So that's the whole stack, except for a few extra modifiers I have sitting here that I was messing with. To recap, we have the base shape is a rectangle that is cut into pieces and then spread out a little bit with some shape keys with modifiers adjusting the length and taper. And then individual bundles are inside different lattices that are within the larger lattice wrapping it onto the back, the individual lattices. Then there are a smoothing that is applied only when the hair is spread out and when the zipping effect is in effect. Although you can use these ones even when it's not. And then there's some more smoothing and some displays that can be messed with. And that's the whole setup. The rig itself is these long bendy bone chains. Let's take a look at those. The hair rig is based on these big bendy bone strands with tweak bones down the length. These behave a lot like a Bezier curve with multiple curve points. The way these work is that there is one big large bendy bone with start and end controllers. And down its length are these segment bones that copy its transforms. And the way you have a bone copy a bendy bone and keep the curve is with this head tail control of the copy for transforms constraint. And it exists in others that sets where down the length it is. Then on this layer, we have more bendy bones. It's a bit hard to see, but these are spread between those segment bones. And those are what actually um, deform the hair. Those are the actual deformed bones, and they are constrained to these tweak bones in between each one. So that's the way this controller controls the whole thing like one large two-handle Bezier curve. And then you can also play with the individual pieces. This kind of rig gets pretty complicated, but the nice thing is you basically only have to make one strand, and then you can just copy and paste that for the whole setup. There's lots of drivers involved on some of these bendy bones, but you only have to make it once. If you copy and paste bones with inner rig, drivers don't get copied. But if you copy and paste it as an object, then they do. So you make one strand once, and then you copy and paste it, and there's your hair rig. Each part of the hair was actually an experiment in slightly different methods of rigging hair. So let's take a look at some of the others. The ponytail is also a bunch of bendy bones following a big bone strand, but each strand only has a single bendy bone this time. 
The problem with this is if you want to do a shape other than what can be represented with two points, it just doesn't work. But I figured I wasn't really trying that with this. What would be ideal would be to have some way to take that more complicated bendy bone strand I used on the back and quickly apply it to all of these strands. But that will take scripting. You can also do other interesting things with multi-piece bendy bones. The hair on the side has some interesting behavior. I can pull this out, and when I rotate, it's affecting a it as if the whole side all the way up to the top is one curve. But when I move this tip, it only adjusts from a certain point. That's because there's several bendy bone segments, which again are following one larger chain. This makes for a pretty nice setup with some limit constraints, so I never stretch this part more than this distance. This is only really used for rotating. But the ends can be stretched, and there's also a special roll control. If I want to twist it. That takes some extra setup because normally bendy bones, if you roll them, they run into some problems where after a certain amount of roll, the mesh flips around once it fits 180 degrees. So that extra roll bone is solving that problem. This setup gives a lot of control for these strands. And of course, another limit distance might be appropriate on this controller to stop me from just stretching this forever. The bangs themselves is actually where I spent the most time experimenting with rigging, only to end up throwing out most of my experimentation. I figured out the flat modeling method, which makes it quite easy to set up the hair mesh, but I wanted to see if I could combine that with some way to generate rigs. This is a bendy bone rig, much like the ponytail, where every strand has its own bone, which gives you a lot of control, and then there's some larger controller bones that affect multiple strands. And this could probably even use a more advanced control setup with better aiming and targets. But what I went through to make this was essentially creating a tool set for generating hair rigs based on meshes. Going back into animation nodes, I used a combination of nodes and scripting to make this. This is a whole suite of bone constraint generating nodes. And then if we go over here, this giant node soup is the lower part is a program for generating bones that align to a mesh based off edge marks and vertex groups. And this upper graph is the actual node graph that generated this bang setup. It takes the mesh as the input. You can see some horizontal seams are used to mark uh, the top of where the bones could go and also vertex groups with the tip. Uh, and essentially it creates a bone then aligns it based on an averaging of the normals down the hair strand and then creates various child bones and, and all of the constraints and drivers based on the position of that parent strand, which also becomes the bendy bone. So this is a great tool to have, but I am not an experienced coder and I was kind of learning as I went. So it's extremely inefficient. It barely works. It breaks constantly. It doesn't produce reliable results, but it is very interesting. What I kind of concluded in the end though, was that it wasn't that hard to just make one bendy bone strand and then copy and paste it. So that's fine, you know, rigging these bangs with that method, it'll take you maybe half an hour. This can do it at one click, you know, it takes it a minute per run or so because it's so poorly optimized, but it would take me more than half an hour just to remember how to use this or to create a new graph because I don't know, I made this back in like the spring and the only part I really remember is that these six nodes are creating the drivers and the bendy one properties. So I think now that I'm a much better coder, there's a lot of potential to make a auto rigging add-on or even with the new mesh nodes, some combination of that and animation nodes and the flat modeling method, it should be possible to just automate every part of the hair workflow I've shown you where you just click a button and you use parameters to adjust the size of your hair sheet, how much it wraps, how thick it is, how much it comes forward, you know, the aspect ratio, and then also have another button to just generate the bones. That's something I'd like to make in the long run. I'll have to see how the tools develop, but if you're interested in something like that, uh, let me know in the comments because it would be a huge amount of work to do. Uh, I, I think it would have to be a, a premium product of some sort because, well, maybe we can find someone more experienced to develop it if I can come up with a plan, but 
I think the community could use a good anime making and rigging tool like that. So maybe I'll be the person to make it. Let me know what you think. Next up is the eyes. Let's take a nice close look and take a look at the rig. The eyes, of course, track to the rig target. Then, as usual in Rigify, those bones control them independently. And then there are two bones that adjust the size of the iris and pupil, and they can be adjusted independently of each other. So you can make some really weird stuff. And if I turn on this other bone layer, there is also rig bones controlling these catch lights on the surface of the eye. So those are faked. There are special considerations when dealing with tune eyes because they are so large. And that means it can be a problem if you use spherical eye. So there have been various different ways this has been dealt with in game engines and the like. And my solution is only really viable in Blender, and I haven't really seen anybody else do it, which is to have my eye mesh be just a curved plane, and then have the eye texture be projected from an object. So as I move the eyes, the eye mesh doesn't move at all. What is actually happening is there are some empty objects here that are moved across the surface of the eye by the rig, and the eye texture is projected from these empty objects. Let's hide everything else so we can take a closer look. The actual mesh of the eye is two planes sitting near each other. The top layer is just a mostly transparent plane with a little bit of gloss to act as a sclera. The lower plane is what actually has the texture. And as we can see, it's just got a bunch of subdivisions and then the spherical texture is projected into it with a displace modifier. Displace modifier can get coordinates from an empty object, in this case, this one. And then there is simply a image texture of a sphere that has then been adjusted a bit with the prop to control the location and size. So wherever this empty goes is where the uh, dip into the mesh gets projected. It doesn't look too great at this subdivision level, but we can turn that up and now it looks pretty good, except for jagged edges around where the sphere is projected. But more subdivision can help with that. That's only on a render. And smooth. With enough subdivision and smooth, it cleans up just fine in the end. That, that, yeah, we don't even need that last one. So now if we move this, we can see it just kind of appears anywhere on the mesh. And since the mesh never has to move or deform, we don't have to worry about the usual issues when dealing with large eyes of it, slipping the outside the head if you're using a spherical eye, or about other flat eye designs where you might have the iris be a separate uh, piece and the eye socket be hollow, but that won't really work with fancier shading. So this is a nice, easy solution. The eyes themselves are mostly created with a procedural texture, but there is some hand-painted details in there as well. The basic idea is the same of using object coordinates to project the textures around the empties so that the whole texture just moves with the rig. Now, if we take a look at this node graph, this looks pretty complicated, but a lot of these is just the same nodes copied in over and over, which is this mapping of the left and right empty mixed together with a left and right uh, vertex color mask so that you don't have to make two stacks for everything or there'd be even more nodes. And then we've got a couple image textures as well. You could also use these object coordinates with images by using a node setup like this to convert them to UV coordinates. Then you can paint whatever images you want and they'll just be projected around the center of the object. So those are two parts. One of those is used to lighten and one to darken. 
the basic idea of a procedural texture like this is that you just make a few procedural shapes and then color ramp them to get stuff like the edge of the line, this fake shadow, and various other things. If we take a look in this group, we can take it apart because this is where it's all combined together. We've got most of the color. Then we've got mask of the pupil with a little bit of lightning in it. The whites. And then the external line. As with the other subjects, it would take a whole tutorial of its own to really go over what's happening in such a complex material. But the basic idea is that we have some procedural textures and they're used to make a bunch of these shapes. And those are then combined together to slowly build up the whole eye. The, the reason to work like this is so that you can drive it by parameters so that you can make multiple different eyes easily off the same material and node groups once you've set it up the first time. Of course, ideally, someone else sets it up and then you just get to use it. So I'll see about releasing this at some point when I've cleaned it up and made it more user-friendly. There are lots of other good procedural eye materials out there already, and basically any of them will work on this um, flattened eye and projected texture method. The character shader group is the same one covered in my original video on tune shading in Blender 2.8. There's been a few changes to it, and I've simplified the nodes in some places because of new nodes added since that video was made. I'll put out a new version with a summary of changes, but we won't go into all the detail on it here. Instead, we'll look at some specific examples of how it was used on different materials. The default for this shader is one layer of tune shading and one layer of soft diffuse shading that's mixed in at different amounts for different materials. But for the cloth, I wanted more depth. So there's a third layer of shading that's been added in. This is still a tune shader, but with a lot of smooth, so it's kind of soft edge. Without it, things look much less interesting. We can also adjust the parameters to have it look different, such as turning up the smooth or altering the size, or adjusting the factor it's being multiplied in at. The other material that has had a lot added to the base is the hair. It uses several layers of procedural textures to build up the hair texture by altering different variables. It also has layers of fake shadows and a fake highlight controlled by the rig. Let's take a look at each. Here's how the hair looks with all the textures and extra stuff disabled. Just tune shading, some regular shading, and a bit of gloss. Then we have several layers of text groups. First, this procedural texture will be used for varying the tune size. This one will be used for bump map. And then we have some fake shading at the tips of the hair. This is the mask for it. And then the Aniso highlight. I've added some mix nodes so we can turn these effects on one at a time and see what each is contributing. First, the size texture. This is altering the shape of the shading and giving us more of a hair stroke effect like you would get if you were painting this with a brush. Next, let's look at the bump map. This one is not very strong, it's a subtle effect that's affecting both the diffuse and the gloss if you look closely. And combined together, we're getting that layered hair texture effect with quite a bit going on if you look closely, but at a distance it blends. And now we'll enable that fake shading at the hair tips. This is a procedural texture that is then combined into the existing shading class. Next is the fake forehead and isopropy highlight. 
it's not a true anisotropy highlight because this is actually just a procedural texture that is then gated by a glossy shader. So that means it reacts to the light. A true anisotropy reacts to the camera more. This does a bit because it's still a gloss, but not as much as others usually do. And the reason I've done it that way is so that I have more control over it. A regular anisotropy highlight you have very little control over, but this one is actually object projected, which means I can rig it, and then I can use the rig to control its size and even its position to some extent. Doing a proper anisotropy effect might be better for animation, because, of course, you'd have to rig this one to move if you're anim animating the camera. But for stills, this is more convenient and gives you more control. Speaking of control, another area where it's really convenient to have it is the face shading. Face is always tough because you want to get your shadow terminators very clean, especially this cheek and the nose. And we can see in the default, my nose has problems, which is due to that topology there. You can see the shadows matches the shape of the quads. This can be addressed in several ways, but none are quite perfect. First of all, you can do normal transfer. This is being transferred from a normal mesh image that looks like this. And initially it makes things worse, but if we turn on subsurf as well, it's working pretty well on the cheek, but the shape is now kind of straight and the nose has been kind of, well, there's too much shading on it and it's on both sides. But with more work on that transfer cage, it could be better, but I've been looking into a way that might be even better still. Here is a setup where the face shading is actually replaced with a spherical texture projected from an object. That makes it perfectly smooth even when the model isn't subsurfed, and since it's rigged, I can make adjustments. I can move it around. This is again only really good for fixed angle stills because, as we see here, it's actually obliterated all the shading there. There should be shading there, but since this is just a texture, there isn't. I'm still investigating the best way to use this method, but I think it has potential for fixing these problems without having to do a paint over or more difficult normal editing. Another material with some very fancy settings is the spell cards, which use a random modular texture. There are two image textures, one for border and one for shapes that I hastily scrawled in Krita. And then a setup that randomizes each card to get three random shapes and one random border and random colors. If I change these seed values, we get a different random generation. It takes a pretty fancy group to make this work, but a lot of this is just the same thing duplicated multiple times. This is another area I've been asked for a standalone tutorial, and we'll see if we can make that happen. It's based on the 4D white noise that was added in 2.81, which is important because it finally lets us do true random seeds that isn't just linked to the object info random. It uses it, but in the past you always had the problem that you couldn't get multiple random numbers per object, and now you can. There are also several camera and pose specific elements. First, there is cast and occlusion shadows rendered out of cycles. These could have been baked to a texture and thus hold up at different angles, but it was easier to just render them to an image and then put that in the shader group and multiply that over everything. Of course, if I change the camera angle, then it's still superimposed wrong because this is just an image using window coordinates. Next, on the long hair in the back, there is some baked cycles bevel. You can see on this hair that some of these edges are a bit harsh, and it would be nicer if this all blended together. And using the bevel node that is only supported in cycles, we can make that happen. So this is a tangent normal map that was baked out of cycles. Lastly, there is the line art. 
This was rendered with LanPR and is now a grease pencil object. LanPR is a new line art tool that's been in development for a while, and it bakes to grease pencil. So it's basically freestyle, but you get the output as a vector object, thanks to grease pencil. And that means you can do important things like tweak it and clean it up. It wasn't quite this clean when I first made it, and I had to make lots of adjustments in finer areas like the face by hand. But that's still a nice flexible workflow. It'll be nice when we have stronger line art tools like the new ones coming with the beer render engine. But for high quality stills, this is still a great workflow. I think it'll be integrated into Blender main pretty soon. All right, we've been through it all. There's more I experimented with, like custom pass setups using drivers, but I decided to hold off on talking about that and some other things because there are new and better options coming up, like the EV AOV system and the new beer render engine. Overall, I feel like this workflow has promise, but there are so many new tools that have come out in just the last few months that look like they'll make it even better. I'm planning to explore beer for custom rendering that gets around many of EV's limitations, and also the new geometry nodes to improve the hair workflow. I think everything is going to get easier and higher quality. I'm always talking about my current projects and experiments on Twitter, and I'll be working on step-by-step -step tutorials about many of the things from this video. And of course, I'm always happy to answer your questions, either here, Twitter, or email. If you want more of this content and want it sooner, please consider supporting me on Patreon. My day job eats up a lot of my time. If I can monetize working on this stuff even a little bit, it'll mean I can spend a lot more time on it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.